makes it. Go ahead. And now, from the dark corners of Paul's underwear, where the exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This interview is sponsored by Palo Alto Networks, creators of the Next Generation Firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at www.paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit www.sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Check out the new Nessus Enterprise and Nessus Enterprise Cloud. Engage your IT department in the vulnerability management process today. And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Awesome. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, or Sazerac, as the case may be, and give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, a man who gets made fun of on his own show every single week. Paul Asadorian. Welcome to Paul's Security Weekly, episode 399, for Thursday, December 11th, 2014. Sorry, I was paying homage to another I, show. Yeah, It'll I, make more sense. It'll make more sense when later. He, after a few drinks and when he actually gets here. That's <coughs> which means I have to leave these ridiculous sunglasses on to bust his balls when he gets here. <coughs> the fu- oh, I thought it was a end of year predictions episode. Future's so bright you gotta wear shades. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. With you and him yeah, on the yeah, show. That's it's going to be a, a shiny, it's happy show. <laughs> Therefore, I had to wear sunglasses balding because head, of all the balding shiny heads happiness. and gray hair might be too oh, much glare. Boy, wow! What? Right? So here we are, episode three hundred and ninety-nine. Make sure you Holy tune in shit. next week, episode four hundred, Friday, December nineteenth. We're having a very exciting all-day show planned. Be sure to check it out. There'll be lots of special guests. We're doing it in support of the EFF. So next week. SecurityWeekly.com forward slash watch. You can go there and watch us be ridiculous all day and interview people and drink and smoke cigars and drink. We're going to put a a camera on the bar? We should have a camera on the bar. (laughs) Absolutely. We can make that happen. We have an illustrious team of production assistants here tonight. Did a fantastic job, aside from the camera angles, which need to be a, a little extra. Space uh, you know, uh, I- if you can join us, that'd be awesome. But if you can't join us, you know, you can be part of the experience. Just come here to studio. Y- you should come here to the studio. But you know, if you can't make it, you could be rocking a hack naked T-shirt. You can, and in fact, we have a very special contest for a chance to win a free hack naked or sm- uh, actually, it's just hack. No, what is that? A free? Oh, so I see. We're doing. If you win this contest, you can get a free hack naked. Aaron, of course, hands me the pink one. It's my best color. This is my favorite shirt. I wear this one all the time. It's very nice. It's very sexy. This one's extra, the one that I've rubbed myself in. You (laughs) have to pay extra for that one. And then we've got, okay, we're going to get all the shirts here on the show. Okay, we've got the red hack naked. That's kind of sure. cool. I, I like the, the, like the red, uh, the red, the red the black. and black is, yeah, is interesting. Nice. Yeah, that's it's a And then we've got the smoke the naked the shirt. Yeah. This is the smoke naked just shirt lady. Just watch, w- watch where the ashes land. Um, so for a chance to win a free hack naked or smoke naked t-shirt, please submit to us a selfie listening or watching to Security Weekly. So you have to take a selfie of yourself while listening to Security Weekly. So you have to get both of those in frame. Now, for those of you that may be puzzled 
Jack, I know you're old and sometimes I, I just want to say this contest is open to everyone except New York State Representative Anthony Weiner. Yes. Is that correct? So, <laughs> well, I know you might be confused because I know you're old and that happens sometimes. But if you're confused as to what a selfie would look like while you're listening to the show, I took a sample selfie of myself to show everyone what that would look like. Um, so that should be coming up on the, the screen, screen here. <laughs> Yes, it should be. However, it right is right out oh, there. It is. is. There it is. Yes, <laughs> indeed. That is what a selfie looks like. That's See, what I got. Headphones. I got like Security you, Weekly you, on you, iTunes in yes. in the background. It took we have me off. very easy to do. I can do it while you're listening to Security Weekly. Take a selfie. Email it to psw at securityweekly dot com before December nineteenth, which is our episode four hundred. And we uh, please include in the subject line free T-shirt contest, and we will pick a winner, and we will send you a free T-shirt. How about that? That's awesome. So, cool, so huh? if they don't win, is there some way to get a discount? Uh, yeah. Everyone who submits, yeah, we'll send them a discount. Well, if you don't or win, or we'll you, you could you could put in that code, right? Or if you listen to the show, or if you don't win, or if you're listening to the show or watching, you should the send show. us a selfie because we we like to. Because we, we love selfies. Look, we make fun of ourselves every single week for your entertainment. It's payback time. That's all I got to say. So, all security listeners now, I've extended this discount out to all security weekly listeners, receive 10% off all products in our store with the discount code IHACKNAKED. IHACKNAKED. Use that as your discount code. 10% off you save on the store. So. Shop.securityweekly.com. You can go there. Welcome, Chris Thomas, to the show, who just joined us. Who the hell's that? If we can hear him. Space Rogue. Oh, Space oh, Rogue. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything. Oh, <laughs> Chris Thom- oh, Space Rogue. Space Rogue. I, I had to pay homage and wear the, the sunglasses tonight. I did not bring mine. I got to get a new pair. Yeah. But I'm not on video anymore, so it's not as important for Well, you're on video well, you now. now. You are now. Yeah, yeah. You are now. <laughs> <laughs> So hey, who was that sexy welcome. voice? Welcome. Glad, glad you we could g- make g- it. You hear? We, we had just had a sexy voice through my yeah, ears. Yeah, I heard what somebody else on the uh, Oh, on yeah. The I have, I've been doing announcements. I haven't introduced everyone. So, of course, Jack is here in the studio. Space Rogue. We're just joining I, us. I have a problem, studio. though. You don't have a drink. I don't have a drink. drink. I, it's, yes. you, it's a uh, long drive. All right, drive. so inter- interviews are done, so I'm going to go uh, address that and We haven't crisis. done the interview, but we've done some introductions. I was told there was a cider. It, all right, the cider's coming. Uh-huh. We're gonna, we'll start there, and then we'll crank up from that Okay. Point. Joff, welcome Joff to the show. Joff, welcome. Uh, g'day. How are you, everybody? It's good to be here again. By the way, I would like to point out, Paul, that taking a selfie of yourself as a phrase is actually somewhat redundant, but that's okay. Um, we'll, we'll forgive you tonight. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, good to be here. Uh, good to see uh, Chris here, um, and uh, yeah, good times. Three hundred ninety-nine. Here we are. Yes. All righty. Um, one last announcement. Please join our new discussions mailing list. We've retired the old mailman server and moved over to a Google Groups. You can join the new list at a link in the show notes. So please go do that. Join our discussions list. Uh, Robin Wood, aka Dingy, Digi Ninja, is pretty lonely. I think he's got most of the posts, including, I think, the first one on the new list. So uh, if you were on the old list, you got an email about joining the new list. That's pretty much the extent of it. I did not auto-subscribe everyone over to the new list because uh, I know how some people feel about Google. That's your prerogative. We respect your privacy and security concerns, but do join us on the new list. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And again, the link is in the show notes. Now, on to our feature interview for this show. I have with us tonight Valerie Thomas and Bill Gardner. Bill is an assistant professor at Marshall University, where he teaches in digital forensics and information assurance program. Valerie Thomas is a principal information security consultant at Securus Con LLC that specializes in social engineering and physical penetration testing. They co-authored the book, Building an Information Security Awareness Program, Defending Against Social Engineering and Technical Threats. Welcome, Bill and Valerie, to the show. Hey, Paul. Hey, hey. So uh, I'll start with uh, Valerie. How did you get your start in information security? Uh, It was kind of a a while ago, so I think I can remember. 
Uh, I was now you only have that excuse if you're Jack, so oh, well, it can't be that long true. ago. Yeah, some yeah, of us have been go. a while ago is is longer for some than others. Well, yes, I didn't specify. Included. That's why I said a while, right? There's a rule in asking a lady her age and, and all of that. We won't go there. Anyway, um, I was actually in my last semester uh, in college as a double E major. And um, I guess that will kind of date myself a little bit. There was a, a small little book, you may have heard of it, that had come out. It was called The Art of Deception. And I somehow got my hands on this book by social engineering the book rep and getting it for free. But that's neither here nor there. And I uh, read through it and I decided, wow, you mean you can be a hacker and get paid to do that? I must learn how to do this. So finished the double E and then uh, sought out a security career with the Department of Defense. Um, that was kind of my training ground, I guess you could say. And then switched over to the commercial side a handful of years later and um, doing my thing ever since. Awesome. Bill? How did you get your start? Bill, you there? Bill, we can't Sorry, hear you. Sorry, I muted, muted. My, I yeah. muted myself and couldn't figure out how to unmute it. It happens. So it happens. It happens. Yeah. <clears throat> I spent too long in academia already. I can't do simple things. Um, I got my start um, probably not in the best ways. I, I used to be on IRC back in the – you all remember the 90s, right? <laughs> um and so. uh, we used to do things like infect each other with backworthfus so that we could, you know, reboot our buddies' computers. You're welcome. Um, that sort yeah. of thing. Um, what, yeah. Do thank you know you very something much. about that? A little bit. <laughs> a little thank, bit. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, and, and then it just sort of. I became a <laughs> systems administrator. I was a systems administrator for 20 years, and then. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I started listening to this show, and I was trying to bake security into what I did, and uh, I, I went back and tried to figure out the first episode I listened to, which was episode 120, I'm sorry, 131 in 2008. Uh, so I started formally getting into security as a career about that time, and then the other big help for me was irongeek.com. Um, I started watching the videos on Iron Geek, and then... Um, I went to the Louisville uh, Metasploit class that, that Adrian had. Adrian and, and he had uh, – Martin was there and Dave and all the founders of DerbyCon. And uh, after that, we founded HackerCon, and HackerCon actually was founded a year before DerbyCon. So I think they came to HackerCon as speakers and said, if these, these bozos can do it, we can do it too. Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell how I got started. Now, you both chose to pick a – somewhat controversial topic um, that we've talked about on the show uh, in, in some detail, and that tends to be the effectiveness of a security awareness program. What's kind of like a, if I gave you each two minutes and you had to define or describe uh, how effective a security awareness program could be, what would your, your answer be? I'll start with Bill this time. Um, well, it's better not having one at all. And I've been in organizations that didn't have one at all, and I had to build one. And one of those organizations got pwned pretty bad before they woke up and said, hey, wait a minute, we need to do something. So after we built all the, all the technical controls, um, we went through and I said, listen, you need a security awareness program because in order to make, you know, to get yourself to a level where you need to be, you need to te teach people not to click on stuff. And, um, it was in an organization that politically I knew it was going to be a struggle, and it literally took years to get them to where they needed to be, but it's a process. Uh, you start at level one and you move further, uh, and, and basically uh, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was that I wanted to put what I've been doing down on paper, and um, – and I think you have to do something. You just can't do anything, not do anything at all. Are they effective? Uh, we've tried to measure the effectiveness. Uh, Valerie wrote the chapter on uh, on uh, metrics in yeah, my we'll talk, own. Yeah, we'll talk uh, about that. I, I've got some questions, specific questions about yeah. metrics for sure. Yeah, but uh, but you know that's 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 how that's my take on it anyway. Valerie. Well, and I think Bill and I are kind of in the same mindset on this. Uh, we don't necessarily agree on everything, so uh, you'll probably hear a little bit of that later on in the show. Excellent. Uh, but uh, to answer the, the question as to you know why why I was interested in this, um, I've been that person. 
that's been responsible for either maintaining or creating an awareness program. And if you're not somebody who's really experienced in the security industry and you're put in charge of maintaining this for everyone in your group, it's incredibly overwhelming because you don't really know where to go and you don't really know where to start. So my hope for this is that it will serve as a starting point for folks that are kind of, kind of new to this game. Um, and for some of my longer term clients, now that I do the, the consulting thing, um, it's, it's kind of the, not quite the measuring stick, um, but, but it's something that they can reference and say, oh, well, we've done that. This is how we've improved. So I think that uh, you got to start somewhere. And that was really the intent behind the book. So now there are some that will say that security awareness programs, you shouldn't bother necessarily, or they're limited in their effectiveness because it only takes one uneducated user to click on a link before it's game over. How do you respond to that? Well, I guess that's really how you measure game over. So in pen testing, when we're allowed to actually include social engineering and sending phishing links and the like, um, do we get further on pen tests? Sometimes, uh, sometimes not. So in one of my more recent ones, um, they had a very mature awareness program. So when I sent out my four, count them, four phishing emails, I got one hit. Had my shell, thought I was golden. I'd already done all my research, I knew exactly where the antivirus was, shut it off, so on and so forth. Ten minutes later, shell drops. Like, what, what is this? The other three people that didn't click reported it. Mm, yeah. And it wasn't just that they had reported it, it was that the company was actually prepared to deal with <coughs> that report once they had received it. So they had used the awareness training to educate their users and turn their users into their human sensors or what have you. And then they used the technology and the processes that they had put in place to actually track down the machines of the folks who received the email and pull them off the network all within 15 minutes. So when this is done properly, it works exceptionally well. Yeah, no, I, I like that use case um, because it doesn't necessarily prevent someone from getting in, but it allows you to do really fast incident response. And I think that's the situation that we're in as organizations is we know we're going to get owned and some of the game becomes now, well, how quickly can I respond? Um, and you look at some of the major breaches like Sony and you just wonder, well, anyway, you wonder a lot of things about how long they were inside of the network. Um, yeah. Um, so what, Valerie, what, uh, you know, you do social engineering as, um, as part of your job. So what are some of the things that you learned on offense that you apply to uh, defense? Oh, a little bit of everything. Um, the, the latest is um, RFID security. So this is kind of my small soapbox. I will get my soapbox out just for a minute here until Bill steals the microphone away from me and uh, drags me off stage. Um, those ID cards that folks carry around, um, I'm, I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. So if you walk downtown or you're on the metro at any certain time of the day, you'll see folks with uh, ID cards dangling from their belts, dangling from their necks, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily in an RFID blocking device. And they're out there for the taking. So that's one of the, the best, I'd say, offensive tricks that I've learned and I apply it in defense now is really properly protecting your proximity cards or your ID cards uh, because there are tools out there, I have them, I've made them, uh, to steal those credentials and then somebody can use those credentials to gain access to your bank accounts, your building where you work, your building where you live and so on. And it's covered in the book. And it is covered in the book. Excellent. So to make people aware that that's something else they should be thinking about. And we couldn't cover everything, but we tried to cover all the basics. What's your recommendation for organizations that are implementing a security awareness program? And it's not just a one-time thing, right? It's because your organization is dynamic. So it's something you have to implement and re-implement as you add and remove employees. Um, what's your advice for folks on how to maintain um, an ongoing security awareness program. 
powering. Oh, I was going to let you have that one. So <laughs> it's okay. It, it's, a, it's all a cycle. Um, it, this is definitely not the once a year, same old PowerPoint presentation that we on Earth on the network share, send it out and wipe our hands clean and say that's that. It, it's got to be completely baked in to the daily lives of your employees. Otherwise, it'll be forgotten. Um, they won't have any reminders of what's important to the company as far as potential threats, what's really active for them at that time. Um, and not just the awareness piece. You also have to have the policies and procedures in place to deal with it as well. So you'd mentioned when someone leaves. What happens when someone leaves? Do we disable their accounts? You know, how quickly does that happen? What's that exit process? So it, it's really so much deeper than just the once a year 15 slide PowerPoint deck. And I've always argued you have to social engineer your uh, your, your employees or your organization into being uh, aware. And awareness is the first step. It's, you know, sort of, you know, like admitting a problem. You have a problem with whatever addiction is the first step. I think we have an addiction to clicking. Uh, most people do. Um, and really, you have to – it's a process. It's a culture. It has to be continual. We, you know, I think we talked about monthly, quarterly, yearly. Uh, I know organizations that do it once a year. I know organizations that do it when people come in the door. And that's the only time they ever talk about it, except, of course, during Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Drink. Um, yeah, but you I mean yeah. so the people resources required to do that on a regular frequency are are pretty great, um, and online kind of virtual training usually sucks. So how do you balance the people resources versus making your online training not suck? <sighs> that's that's a that's a tough question. I think that you have to be engaging, uh, you know, um, and. It has to be more than, hey, we're going to go into a room where I'm going to preach at you. It has to be a process where that um, you, you have some more engaging way of, uh, of, of interacting with people. It has to be active learning. It's not passive learning. Uh, even if you sort of show them what it looks like when they get fished, if you have the re resources to do that. But just talking to people and opening up communications, what you'll find is the people will start reporting stuff. And the problem really is is sometimes it, these these gonna, these things sort of come become um, too effective. They see a hacker behind every rock. Um, they'll start reporting all kinds of things. But I'd rather see it at least if I'm the system administrator or if I'm in charge of, of uh, the security for organization. I'd rather see those, uh, even though they might be false positives, than for them to go, oh, it's just some something that's annoying or it's a virus or. Um, you know, they just shrug it off. So, but in the same way that we should, as an organization, identify our most critical assets and put our security efforts in front of them or towards them or around them, or however you want to phrase it, is it the same thing when you do security awareness training? Because I tend to think of uh, certain scenarios such as the first person that I see when I work, walk through the door could be the most susceptible to mm -hmm. social engineering in a physical sense. So... Do you have different levels of security awareness training for whatever people's roles are going to be in the organization? Yes, and we say that it should be targeted. Uh, you just can't give the same message to everyone. Mm. Uh, it, it's sort of like internal marketing. It has to be targeted. You don't give the, secu the same security awareness uh, information to the guy in the mailroom as you do the CEO. Uh, the receptionist, you know, we've, 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 we've asked receptionists to be security guards. Yeah. Um, and that's a bad situation. And what you need to do is to let them know about what they should be looking for and who they should call or who they should ping if they get a situation where something is susceptible, you know, where they suspect something because it's not their job to come out and, and wrestle someone to the ground or, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a bad situation. And a, a receptionist is going to want to help you if you come in and start asking questions. So you have to let them know that not everyone has the best intentions uh, when they start asking questions. And I think Bill hit on a really good point there. So it's not necessarily in everybody's job description to be a security professional. So I think that a lot of training programs fail because the goal in the creator's mind is to turn everybody into a, a professional. 
you should be able to spot any kind of phishing email. You should be able to spot any kind of social engineering attempt. Where those expectations are just unrealistic. It's not the receptionist's job to be a security specialist. It's her job to understand the basics of what's supposed to happen and to look for anomalies. Your user base are nothing but anomaly detectors. And it's not her job to be able to understand that. Her job is to be able to pick up the phone, type an email, whatever the reporting process is, to get somebody on the phone whose job is security. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, so Paul, I, ha I have a yes, quick question. John, you don't know, mind me uh, coming in no, there. No, please so, do. You know, you know, Valerie, in that light, um, d does this mean to you that, that, that for a, mat a m more mature organization, when they're scaling those incident response efforts, that they kind of have to have a tiered instrument response where that, that level one is, is, is the security professional that receptionist can reach or that, that employee can reach so that, so that they can take over from there and, and, and you know, sort the wheat from the chaff? Can you comment on that? Absolutely. So that, that entry point is not always going to be the same. And like you said, this is very, it can be difficult to scale, especially in very large organizations. So back to the educating folks based on their job role, um, that also should coincide with who they really need to report things to. So in the case with the secretary, for what appear to be physical threats, then her reporting process, loosely, uh, should include somebody in the physical security chain. Um, if she sees something that's more of a suspicious email, you know, that may go to the help desk. Um, and then at that point, your help desk folks might be that first layer of, wow, this doesn't look right. We need to get this to the right security person. So I think you really need to bake it into the tiers of your environment. Um, some of us are fortunate enough to have several tiers, and some of us, it's one security person. Yep. So I think that you really need to understand your organization and how it's scaled before you can really properly show folks where they should go. And I, I regularly work with very, very small to mid-sized organization. And mid-sized to us means you have, you know, an IT uh, service desk of four people, uh, which is very small in, in other places. But where I am geographically, most places are pretty small. Yeah, so I mean, th I think that's interesting that, that um, your response um, – you know, again, sort of puts that onus back on an organization having a, a mature response, uh, a, a mature cycle uh, and process to, to what they're doing, uh, no matter what the size. I mean, they can even be, they can be a one or two kind of person shop, but as long as they have a, a well-defined process, then the onus comes off of those individuals who are definitely not security professionals and comes back on the people that are, you know, supposed to be dealing with that, so... Yeah, yeah I totally you, agree. You uh, I, I yeah. think just... of this as a similar as um, using a network IDS. So it, it doesn't matter how many alerts you get a day if nobody is reviewing them or nobody is properly trained in the process of what happens next, then it's really of no use to you. Yeah, let me just yeah. jump in here real quick. I mean, a lot of people talk about user education and they say that, oh, we're going to teach all the users everything and then we'll be perfect and life will be wonderful and that's great and I think user education is a very important part but I think a lot of people are using it as a crutch and they're using user education as a way for them to not do their jobs mm. all right that's you, a problem we, we, yep. it is a problem we need to still focus on building secure systems and having these processes in place as you've mentioned that when something bad happens we know what to do when the phishing email comes in and when the user clicks on it we have a process in place that can re, uh, you know, fix that issue. And we can't just say, oh, we're going to educate the users and solve everything because it doesn't work that way. It is important well, and it is a yeah. step that we need to take, but it's not something that's the, you know, fix all that's going to magically make everything <clears throat> better. There's a chart in a book uh, which is called Elements of a Mature Security Program, which starts at policies and procedures. And really, user awareness is just one of those layers. Um, it's not even the first layer. And then uh, you know, it's it's part of a layered defense. It's um, it's one of the tools in your defensive um, arsenal. It's not an end all or be all. Uh, I'd rather see someone build a security awareness program than buy cyber insurance. Drink. Um, 
you know, I, I think a lot of people just say, well, we'll do, we'll, we'll get insurance and everything will be fine. I don't think those people realize when they go to file a claim and they ask you, well, what did you do in order to, to uh, manage your, your risk? And they say nothing. They're not going to pay their claim. Um, and I think that's going to be an issue as we move forward. Yeah, it definitely will. There's already been several lawsuits of breaches where people had insurance uh, and then the insurance company said, nope, not covering it. And then there were lawsuits afterwards. So. Yeah. Uh, that is a current problem that will only get bigger as time goes on. Um, so what were uh, some of the fun things that you found when writing a book? You said there was disagreements or interesting stories to tell. I don't know if there are disagreements. I, I don't think that – I mean I think that we do disagree on some things. Uh, passwords, for example. Lowry's a big fan of the password vault. Um, I'm not. Um you know, um, I, I think why, password why not, vaults Bill? have. Yeah, I think they're just as vulnerable as any other piece of software. I still think you, that writing down passwords and putting them in your wallet's the safest thing to do. Well, and in a small environment, perhaps that is the best way. Yeah, but in a bigger environment, yeah, it, it may, may not, not be. be. Yeah, well, especially I, I deal a lot with. Um, wait, with wait, wait! Are, you guys aren't suggesting that solutions to security problems are contextual and require some thought about the environment. <laughs> well, you know, there's nuts. no buzzword for that, that's but nuts. you know, that's drink. That's yeah, that's we, do, we, we need a buzzword. We get Jack a strong one. Drink. Yes, I think it's, that we need to coin our own buzzword. Wait, so what do you, so sure. let me derail it because that's what I'm good at. How about uh, LastPass <laughs> now offering the ability to let it change your passwords for you without user interaction. Have you seen this? Well, why the hell not? <laughs> <laughs> why the hell? Here, what here's the, my take. Yeah, that yeah, that's a, new. Is that a that's, feature? That's new. It, it'll, it'll fix your passwords for you and keep track of them. Oh. And here's the really terrifying thing. My. Wow. For the <laughs> vast majority of people. They'll just click, yeah, sure, go ahead. But I think they'll be better off. Oh, they will. The yeah. vast majority I of people agree. will be I better agree. off. Completely mm -hmm. agree. I will However, never, ever, ever do that. But for most people, sure, go right ahead. For, I mean, the but I mean, right, the because what that's going to do is, because otherwise, people would have to be like crazy cat ladies to have enough cats to have names for their cats <laughs> to use for passwords <laughs> to be secure on the Internet. Yeah, but here's the thing. It's more likely that one website that you log into is going to be hacked and someone's going to get your password. And if you're using the same password on all those sites, nobody does that's it. bad. <laughs> if you're using LastPass, and even doing the what we're kind of deeming as insecure thing of letting LastPass change your passwords, you're still better off than using the same password for every website. Y you do have to have an unhealthy amount of faith in 1Password or LastPass yeah. or, or whatever. For me, it's 1Password. I, uh, I, I was with you, Bill, for a long time. I was like, I'm not using a password manager, and I finally bit the bullet because we talked about it a lot on the show, and I just made the risk decision that I would I would use a password manager. You know now what? I don't use it on my phone because I don't what, what, I don't well, trust I, it that much. I I, I got to interject. Paul Paul I I think is making the point, and I actually agree with him. Holy shit! Are you yeah. sober? <laughs> Life is over as we know it. That that. The human is weaker than the technology that these password vault vendors are putting forward, and I think that's true. Uh, I think I, the human is the weak link, always has been the weak link, and password vaulting as a concept um, is stronger than the human um, by far. Uh, absolutely. So. Let me go on a rant for a second. Uh -oh. Pat, <laughs> passwords right. are broken. Passwords are broken. I'm not drunk, so I'm not good at ranting uh, when I'm sober. Passwords are broken. Why can I get two-factor authentication on my WoW account but not on my bank account? To me, that's... Change banks. Mm. Yeah, well. Change <laughs> banks. There's, I, there's get, a, get all my uh, money yeah. in gold, right? There, there, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's that wrong. bothers me too. <laughs> well, by the way, uh, uh, there's yeah. <laughs> there's a bank that I deal with that lets me have two-factor authentication, but on most of the things I do with them, they don't let me have complex passwords, and okay, their web banks? properties 
um, perform unnatural sexual acts on <laughs> inanimate <laughs> objects. <laughs> Don't even get me started about my bank's website. I, it's and terrible. then there's another bank that's easy to use and friendly on the web and capable and has crappy password policies. And even I use the one that lets me do what I need to do, and I just am paranoid about checking on it. Because but here's the thing. I don't Two-factor auth. It's, it's coming to my phone, which is an Android, so that's safe. It's fine. But oh, so Nobody's going to own your phone. We're screwed anyway. I don't, put all my <laughs> passwords in my pa- <laughs> I don't put all my passwords Sorry. in my password manager. There are certain passwords that I, I keep elsewhere. I keep it in a separate encrypted file, not in my online password store. So there are certain things that are a higher security level. Like if you want to log in and like manage my domains on Namecheap or log into Rackspace... Totally separate set of security. All of my passwords are stored in a very highly secure location, a legal pad on my desk. Yeah. You want my passwords, you got to break into my house. My house is fairly secure. Most people don't know where I live. I'm not really that worried about it. But that means if I'm on my phone in your studio, a thousand miles away from my house, I have right. problems logging it, into it, stuff. It, when we're talking about password managers, it's worth noting, too, that you know you don't have to leave them in the logged on state. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you can set that password manager so you have to type in that because we all have ungodly passphrases, right? Nobody, nobody's got password one. Is there? Or, uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> some of us have painful, That's what painfully me is long. The do right, painfully long, but easy to type because you want to be able to pull those things up on your phone. And I, I'm I'm sorry I, I'm I'm aroused because the eyes that I'm getting from across the board there, but um. he's not looking at me. Okay, he's uh, looking okay, at I me. Put a spin <laughs> what? I, what? I want to put a spin what? On what? What? <laughs> what? What do you? Everybody, what do you think of this? Okay. There's these it's password sucks. vault vendors <laughs> out there. Do you not think, or do you think that nation state actors? I'm not targeting those entities. If you're targeted by a nation state, you are paranoid. Well, first of all, you, you're, you're paranoid. And if you actually are targeted by a nation state, it's over. So it, just, it, and it depends on which into, one. Does, I mean, does this if not it's not playing the Bill's argument if, if that it's, using if it's, vaults is dangerous. It, well, I think you should have a vault to have the master password to your vault that keeps your password. That's the only way to do it. If you've if you're targeted by a, a nation state or uh, a- if ABT. you know what, I'll just pull that out. If you are if you personally is tar- are targeted, you're screwed. Uh, but password vaults make it easier to have a unique password for every website, yep. so that minimizes the the run of the mill stuff. And then you can Here's, ramp it up from there. And, and if you really are concerned and you have some high value properties like banking, depend it depends on what your environment is, but maybe you don't want to trust banking, but you'll use a password vault for a farce book or linked or dummies or whatever 27 nessus servers um <laughs> you know it, Just whatever you're using it for you're, you're keeping track of a bunch of different things you know that's per, uh, again you have to kind of think about oh my god you have to think about risk and context and shit look here, this I like is hard worries, Don't drink. here's what worries me I, about I like the technology what bothers is their me. software which means they have vulnerabilities no and way. I've done yeah. some fuzzing with password applications, and I don't like what I see. Um, it, that's that to me. It's 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 more vulnerable and easy to get a hold of than something that's in my wallet. And I don't write down a lot of passwords. If you put all these things in a password vault, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So if it's there compromised, it's compromised big time. So uh, along with what Bill was saying, what's, what bothers me is, is these uh, some of the password vault vendors, I won't name any particularly name them all names here, started out with really good intentions where they said, look, we're going to store your data with a, you know, uh, AES-256 uh, or AES-128, you know, crypto algorithm, and we do not know your master password. 
and then they get pressure from the user base to say, well, what if I forget it, right? Yep. And then when that happens, they go, okay, well, we'll introduce a feature so that you can actually have a recovery of that. But user, beware, because that means you're weakening the overall solution if they're a responsible vendor, right? Um, and that's where it starts to go wrong because you're interesting, int introducing back into the equation the weakest link, which is the user themselves, right? Th that's my assertion on password vaults. Um, I use them. I, I will say I use them, but um, it it's it's not a perfect solution by any means. No, unfortunately, I, I don't think we have any perfect solutions. And in some cases, password vaults make perfect sense. In other cases, they don't. Um, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you don't have to worry about a nation state level threat on a password safe as much as you have to worry about your average attacker. Um, we've backdoored password safes for pen tests before. And in situations where we had local access to the machine, we didn't have the pseudo password, and they had a password vault. So and it phishing can be works done. too. Phishing works with password so, vaults too. Yeah. Keith stroke loggers work really well too. This is one of those yeah. clipboard um, where your corporate infrastructure may encourage the use of a password vault because they have good intentions. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, the road to here is paved with good intentions. Uh, that means everybody in the company uses the same vault. Uh, it's pushed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a great idea, except. No, and it's uh, not. I really <laughs> kind of like the idea, but no, I, I, I don't. Um, and I think there's, just there's a plus and minus there. I mean, I just see this run in Windows 10 sometimes. and everything will be good. It's, it's a mixed bag. I think Valerie's right. Yeah, it's exactly. a mixed bag. I see this in enterprise pen tests all the time where we compromise one or two servers. Oh, they have common accounts. Guess what? They have the same password um, because the administrator has 65 of these servers that they're responsible for. And they can't write down 65 unique passwords and put it in their wallet or remember them. Or then they increment them by one or two or three or so on and so forth. So I think that using the same password reuse in an environment can be even more damaging than <clears throat> using the generate feature on a safe. And that's the reason I like two-factor better than password vaults. Even though it's not got its own issues as well. But to, to take this down a rat hole, um, <laughs> yeah, wait, if you want to take this further? to the next level, to me it's two-factor. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm in agreement with, uh, <laughs> with Bill on this one. I think two-factor does uh, mitigate a significant number of risks because... So you know, SMS that code to m my Android? Well, depending on how you <laughs> think, man. Like, qualify well, that's okay. that. No, no I've, I've got an authenticator app. I, I did have to jump outside of the, the Google Play Store to download my authenticator app, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but for the link, vast right? majority of users, it does Quick increase here. their or lower their risk. Let's yes. put it that way. It, for the for the majority, and what we're really after is, is the majority, right? Uh, um, yes, we know there is very sophisticated malware that actually uses a coordinated approach and tries to intercept the two factor um, approaches, especially the common approaches. But still, overall, as a technology, I think two factor is making a step in the right direction. So as long as you don't do anything stupid like have signing keys on a box that's available to the internet. So, yep. Valerie and Bill, I've now got the most difficult <laughs> questions <laughs> for you. <laughs> Finally, we get down to the serious business. This is serious business. <laughs> so, here's what I'll do. Valerie and Bill, we're going to play five questions. I'm going to start with uh, Valerie because she's on the okay. left-hand side of the screen. I'm going <laughs> to ask her the first question, and then Bill's going to answer that question. And then Bill's going to answer the second question so that Valerie has time to prepare for it and so on and so forth. So I'm already okay. confused, but go ahead. That's <laughs> perfect. That's ex when we, that is exactly when we ask goals. you shit, answer it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Okay. So, Valerie, three words to describe yourself. Hmm. Tick, 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 tick. tick. <laughs> there's no time limit in space. Come on now. <laughs> Where's the, There's no Jeopardy music in the background. Sorry. This we'll work on that for next There time. we go. Okay. I feel yeah, better somebody's now. Somebody's got to sing. They'll okay, fill it in words. editing. Uh, I'm going to get them sued. Mother and mischief. Bill? 
you mad bro? <laughs> so, Bill, I like it. if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Armed robots. Valerie? Cyanide. Valerie, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? How to get away with almost everything. Bill? Shameless self-promoter. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, in the, ga- in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Yes. <laughs> Valerie? Well, it's just both at once, right? Both hands? <laughs> Valerie? Wow. Pick two wow. celebrities. Okay. Anyway, the things Valerie, I didn't know. choose two <laughs> celebrities to be your parents. Ooh, celebrities. Yeah, Not real good one. with celebrities. I know, but it's a fictitious game, so. There's okay. no, there's no wrong answer game? here, Valerie. It's not like you're getting points. Man. But, but I want to make a good choice. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, real, not real good with celebrities. Okay, we'll go to Bill. Bill. Go to Bill. Okay. And we'll come back to you, Valerie. Uh, I Choose. think it would be Kevin Smith and Jennifer Garner. Nice. Nice. Interesting. I like the Jennifer Garner choice a lot. She's from my home. She's her. I live in her hometown, so uh, yeah. that's, that was my choice. She's very a very nice person. Bit figure, yes. Valerie, we're, we're, we Bill answered that very quick. Now the pressure's on. He did. It's almost like he was prepared, prepared for that, and he thought about it because he listened to he, the show. He has thought about this before. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, change the, okay. Change the questions. Um, I do have a larger set of questions, but. People you know, have complained if I ask a, a different large question. Set. They're like, oh, yeah. I wanted to hear that person's answer of the question you asked last week. So <laughs> I can't make anyone happy, apparently. I didn't know that was your job, to make people happy. It, well, I do my best <laughs> sometimes, maybe. Okay, celebrity. <laughs> Sean Connery and who's the girl who plays Nikita? Which Nikita? Which one? The movie. The original French movie? Yes. That was a, that would be a good choice. We'll go with the original I French. Yeah, yeah, wait, the rem- French one or the it. American version? No, French. The, the original the French, French version. The American version doesn't exist in it, my mind. It was <laughs> terrible. The original French <laughs> version was like awesome. the last three Star Wars <laughs> movies. <laughs> yes. It's my answer. Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> it's your answer. Just let us define this it for you, okay? This is my answer. <laughs> 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 well, Valerie and Bill, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Yeah. Thanks so fun. much, guys. You can purchase their <laughs> book, you. Building an Information Security Awareness Program, Defending Against Social Engineering and Technical Threats, on Amazon by visiting the link in the show notes and even read a book review published on net-security.org. All of that information is in the show notes. Thank you again for appearing on the show. With Thanks that, so we're going to take a short commercial break, come back, and talk about a whole mess of stuff going on in the security world. I in may, our I may of the even get to rant tonight. There might be ranting. (laughs) Warning, there might be ranting. So stay tuned.